Good afternoon. So I'm the closing act, I guess. Uh, I'm, I'm what separates you from the raffle and from the beer. So I understand how important it is going to be for me to get through this presentation so we can get to the more important stuff. Uh, so I will try to go relatively quickly and actually hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to address questions and what have. If for some reason we run out of time and you still have questions at the end of the presentation as a teaser, uh, my contact info is there. Feel free to reach out at any time. So, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Mom USA Dallas 2016. Uh, my presentation is going to be talking a little bit about protecting the edge of your network uh, using things like BGP, unicast reverse path forwarding, uh, and source uh, slash uh, real-time black holing. <clears throat> a little bit about me. I'm uh, based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, United States. That's, uh, New Mexico is a state that's squished in between Texas and Arizona. Uh, sometimes we get confused with Mexico, but we're the new Mexico. Um, I will travel for packet, dollars, food, and good scotch. So if you need something, um, I'm probably willing to go there. I am a microtech instructor. Uh, I'm also a network operator. We have a small company in New Mexico. We provide fiber to the home. We provide wireless services. We dig the ground up. We put a fiber cable in. We run fiber to homes. We run fiber to businesses. We're about 10 years old. Um, I also used to, in a previous life, I ran IANA's LROOT DNS server. So I've done a little bit of DNS and a little bit of large-scale networking. Uh, I've built several global ATM, not automated teller machine, but asynchronous transfer mode, which is sort of like the predecessor to MPLS, because really all MPLS is is ATM over Ethernet with little tags. Uh, we have about 800 BGP peers. We are peering in LA, San Jose, uh, Ashburn soon, uh, uh, AMSIX, we're going to get a 10 gig wave across the Atlantic that goes into AMSIX, um, and we'll be peering over there. That's part of our DDoS mitigation strategy. Um, and yes, we do sell 1 gig and 10 gig for those, and I'll leave the shameless sales plugs to that line and go from there. If you need bandwidth, we have it. <clears throat> so talking about protecting the edge, what can we protect? What is the edge? You have the edge that faces your customer, and you have the edge that faces the rest of the world. They're both edges into your network, and so we want to be able to protect that. We want to protect our core. We want to be able to protect based on destination addresses. We want to be able to protect based on source addresses. And we want to be able to protect based on spoofed or faked source IP addresses. We want to protect other networks. So first, let's talk about protecting and helping your neighbor, because we want to be a good netizen. We want to be a good citizen on the internet. And we want to be able to make sure that something on our network is not causing pain to your neighbor across the street or across the country. And so one of the most important things to do is let's talk about per, uh, filtering and protecting based on source spoofed packets. We will talk a little bit more about this in the presentation, but primarily BCP38 or best in current practices as documented and, and approved by the Inter Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, uh, discusses in detail protecting against source boot packets. There's been lots of debate about this. Some people don't do it. Some people think it's hard. Some people just don't know. Some people think it ruins the network. My answer, just do it. Because it's the right thing to do in the right places on your network. Where should we prevent? You should prevent source boot packets at the access edge. So. Pick on somebody here, Mr. Josh, um, with our beer sponsors, right? You're the spon you guys are the beer sponsors afterwards, so we got to give shout outs to Baltic here. Um, if Josh is my customer and he is sending me packets, I want to make sure those packets coming to me are sourced with a valid address that is in fact not, is in fact Josh and not Lorenzo. Okay, because I do not want Josh sending me packets that look like they're coming from Italy or Spain or Latvia or wherever. We also want to pre prevent traffic at our distribution network. 
We want to be able to filter at our inter-provider edge, in other words, where we interconnect with peers at an exchange point, for example, or our transit providers. These are all places that you have control over being able to deal with source spoofed packets. Some places are better than others. And so I'm going to say real quick, this is not a silver bullet. It doesn't fix all problems. It does not grow hair. It does not make you thin or, any, I, I know, uh, or anything else like that. So you have to think about where you're going to apply it in your network. Well, how do we prevent bad packets? Let's just take a step back and talk about how do we prevent bad packets. We can do ACLs, ACLs. We can write a firewall rule or a filter and apply it to our device and drop traffic based on source or destination in a firewall rule. Great. <clears throat> That's what a lot of us will do. That's what a lot of small networks will do. Place them on the edge. They're easy to maintain, right? Even when you have hundreds of routers, you can replicate those rules and cut and paste them into every one of your routers all over the network. Not. There's got to be a better way. Building scripts or building filters that are based on text files and having to replicate that across your network is, from a routing perspective and a route update perspective, a slow process and can be fraught with errors. There are easier ways to do it. BGP. How many folks here run BGP in your network? Okay. How many of you would say that BGP uh, is, is the thing that actually makes the routing decision? Okay. How many would you agree with that, that BGP is a signaling or control plane protocol to tell you about how to get somewhere? Okay. Correct. In my mind, BGP is a signaling protocol. It is a protocol that says to my neighbor, hey, I know how to get here. This is how you can get to me. It doesn't actually make the route decision. It just simply says, here's where I can go. And BGP is a industry standard. So it's used across all kinds of vendors, whether it's Microtik, Juniper, the C company, the H company, you fill in the blank, right? So we can use BGP to signal routes and places that we want to get to and places we don't want to get to. We can also use URPF, Unicast Reverse Path Forwarding, as documented in RFC 3704. If you want to know more about that, go read the RFC. I'm sure it'll help you sleep on a long haul flight home, but it is in fact a great document. A lot of times URPF is done in hardware. It's low impact on CPU and has some very interesting side benefits, which we'll get to. So let's talk about BGP black holing because the typical thing we're going to do is my customer Josh here is running this great website and all of a sudden a whole bunch of miscreants are deciding to try to take him off the air and knock his website off for economic reasons or they're mad or they're trying to have some sort of statement or whatever their reason is for sending denial of service. And I'm an ISP that only has a single one gig uplink transit connection to the internet and these guys, if we listen to Tom's presentation from earlier, what was the force multiplier of a DNS attack? 54 to 1, right. So all I need is some, somebody somewhere with one gigabit of traffic out, and I'll get 54 gigabits of distributed DNS amplification heading right towards my customer. Well, wait a minute, my uplink is only one gig. Am I alive or dead? Dead. I'm done. Toast. <clears throat> so I can go, the first results, people say, well, I can go put a filter in. But a filter isn't going to solve the problem because the traffic has already come down to link to me, right? So I'm dead. What if I could get my upstream to drop it for me? Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. Okay. I know the beer's coming, so you got to work with me here. All right? <clears throat> So great, we can get our upstream to drop it. So what do we do? Pick up the phone, call the upstream. Thank you for calling technical support. We will be with you in one hour and 37 minutes. Oh my God, I gotta wait forever. So now you're on the phone, you're waiting. Now you're gonna talk to tier one, you gotta convince them what a filter is. <laughs> Sounds like a few of you have done this before. What if there's an automated way we could do this? There is. 
we can use real-time black holing and setting up a BGP session with our upstream provider. And as Tom said, if your upstream provider doesn't do it, lose them, find somebody that does. You can quote me on that too. Um, and you can turn around and send them a route with a specific community tag. How many here knows what community tags are? Okay, don't get over complicated. Community tag is just a little sticky note we put on the route that says, hey, here's a sticky note, there's some little note thing here. Somebody's gonna process based on that sticky note. So now I send my upstream this slash 32, the IP address of Josh, and I have this community tag on it, and let's say that community tag is 666 colon 666, poof. My upstream receives that, they process it, they do a match based on that community tag, and they set next hop to Josh's IP address, just his slash 32. They set net hop, net next hop, excuse me, <clears throat> to that, and, and push it towards black hole or null route. Great! Josh's traffic is done! My internet connection is back and all my customers, well wait a minute, not all my customers, almost all of my customers are happy. We've pushed the problem upstream, however, my victim is still dead. Josh's website is still dead, not working, can't get to it. More importantly, anything else he's trying to get to out from that server isn't going to come back to him either, right? So we just sort of sledgehammered this slightly with a scalpel. <clears throat> so you use BGP to tell your peers in your transit, your customer is getting DDoSed, poof, your victim is really a vi now really a victim, but the rest of your network is back up and is happy. So you've solved the problem and sort of, we've had some shout outs to other characters and we've had the minions up here and a few others through the day. So remember, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So I've now just helped my DDoS implementer by truly DDoSing my customer. He is completely off the network. But my network is back up and the rest of my customers are back up. So, okay, there's got to be a way of doing this where we can not completely kill. So let's talk a little bit about unicast reverse path forwarding. How does this work? What do routers usually make decisions on? Come on, guys. Where does it want to go? Destination IP. Okay, router looks at the destination, says, hey, go there. Destiny. We typically don't care about source. The minute we start looking at source, we're going into ACLs, we may be going into a CPU or processor-based uh, part of the system as opposed to inside of hardware, depending on your platform. With unicast reverse path forwarding, however, we actually can look at the source. So there are two modes to unicast reverse path forwarding. There's strict and there's loose. And strict says this. Lorenzo sends me a packet with an IP address on it. I'm going to take that source and I'm going to look in my FIB, my forwarding information base, and I'm going to see whether or not that source address is in fact reachable on the link that it came in on from Lorenzo. And if it is, I'm going to process the rest of the packet and move on. If it is not, I'm going to drop it. There's gonna be little bits on the floor. We're done, okay? So that is strict mode. My general recommendation is, is that, first of all, you lab this stuff up, and when you're comfortable with it, you deploy it into your network so that on the edge, your customer-facing, your singly-homed customer-facing interfaces, you implement strict. Because that will prevent that customer from sending you spoofed packets. You can do this in ACLs, but why have to manage a growing list of ACLs and the cumbersome of all that when you can do one simple little command on an interface or on a device that solves that problem? <clears throat> so now the router, as it says here, looks at the source. If it's there, good. If not, drop, and that's what strict is. So there's another mode called loose. Loose says, 
that if Josh sends me a packet and the source IP address of that packet is reachable in my routing table, I'm going to go ahead and process it. If it's not in my routing table, I'm going to drop it. There's a little exception to that, and that's null. If that route's next hop happens to be black hole or null, depending on your device, how they ever they call a null route, loose will drop the packet if it's a next hop is black hole or next hop is null. Hmm, cool. So we can filter based on URPF. So you can filter it strictly on your single home customers. It will prevent spoofed packets from entering your network. Will prevent your customers from participating in bad things on the internet. Will keep the net cleaner. It'll save you money. Money. And it'll help your wireless network because now you're not transporting packets back to some tower or back to some aggregation point and then dropping it. Because you've already burnt airtime, you've already burnt packet time to get it somewhere to drop when you could drop it on the edge. So I like to push things out to the edge and drop it as close to the edge as possible. Make sure you test this. I cannot stress this enough. MicroTik equipment is very affordable. You should have a lab of 15 or 20 2011s easily in a lab that are set up to test things. You can easily test this. You can check that it works, use a traffic generator, build some fake packets, shove it through and see what happens. If you don't and you just simply go turning it on, you probably will break things. Enough of the American labels and warnings. <clears throat> but I can't drop everything because Josh is an important customer they're trying to sell MicroTik routers to everybody else because he is a great master distributor. So what do we do? I can't just write ACLs because I can't write ACLs for 3,000 source spoofed IP addresses. So how do I solve that? <clears throat> we use BGP. We can turn around and use the URPF loose feature. Remember what we said. What will what will URPF loose drop on? Pardon? What's well, not reachable? So null routed or not in the routing table, right? So if it's in the routing table, but its next top is black hole, it'll drop. Well, cool. Can we inject routes into our routing table? Can we build filters that take routes and set the next top on that route or that prefix to black hole? Yes. So now what you can do is you can use URPF loose to see that ne the set next top is black hole and URPF loose will drop. So you can inject the source IP of bad traffic into your BGP routing table with a particular community tag on it, have your BGP speakers match on that community tag and set next hop. I think I just said the whole next slide. But you have to have a little injector machine. And so I use a little machine, a separate Linux machine to do that. I set a community tag of 65,000 colon 666. Um, I also set no export. Can anybody tell me why setting no export on these uh, announcements is important? You want to stay on your network, so that's what no export will do. It'll keep it from being announced out to your other EBGP peers, right? Okay. Why does that matter? This is bad traffic. Don't I want to tell the whole world it's bad? Pardon? That's a private community tag. Or, well, there's no such thing as private. It's just a community tag. Don't confuse that with as an AS. It's just a number with a colon and another number. But why don't I want to tell Cogent that this is bad traffic so Cogent doesn't have to deal with it either? Yes, sir. And if I had a prize, I would throw it to you. <clears throat> Correct. You do not want to leak the IP addresses that you want to drop based on sources, you do not want to leak those out 
to your peers, whether they are exchange point peers or they're transit peers, because all you're going to do is become the receiver of that traffic going to those source spoofed addresses. Remember, most specific routes. I mean, most specific uh, route wins. Hopefully, your upstream peers are filtering the announcements you are sending to them. That typically seems to be more the case on transit links than it does on peering exchange point links. But you want to make sure that you do no export. And in your outbound filters towards your peers, you want to match on 65,000 colon 666 and also make sure that there's an explicit reject or drop so that you've got to double step why that announcement's not going to go out. Okay? So you have a BGP in filter. It sets next top to black hole. Route is updated at the injector. All of your BGP speakers get this route update and poof. Packets from that IP address with that source are no longer going to Josh and disrupting his fancy website. And as we learn more about more source addresses, we can quickly update them and put them into play. Caution, 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 caution. You must. And for those of you that don't know about RFCs, there are RFCs that document what the words mean in RFCs. <laughs> I kid you not. I give you RFC 2119, which in fact documents what the word must means. And so in my use here, must is in the spirit of 2119. Make sure you do not redistribute these source IPs to your peers or transit. And if for some reason you decide you need to or want to, make sure you explicitly understand why between you and your other BGP neighbor. Make sure your BGP out filters drop all prefixes with the community tag you're using as a double insurance that you're not going to leak. So what can I use as an injector? My favorite is Exa BGP. It's free, as in free beer, which will be happening very shortly, I promise you. It works. It supports cool things like JSON. It has an API. Um, it runs on Linux. It's easy to set up. And you can do lots of really cool things with it. So in the previous presentation, we talk, the gentleman talked about taking scripts running those scripts to pull down IP addresses from various places to build ACLs to throw in your routers to drop traffic. Sweet, I do the same thing. I download those address lists, I process them, I shove them into exit BGP, so I only have to process them in one place, at one location, and BGP pushes them out to all of my world, and I drop, okay? I don't have to worry about having a lot more uh, complexity, in my opinion, on a whole bunch of devices. <clears throat> Data sources for injectors. NetFlow, NFSEN as a flow collector. If you want to know more about NetFlow with uh, Microtik devices and so forth, I send you to my colleague Lorenzo's uh, presentation, a great presentation on NetFlow and Microtik. Go watch it, go read it. Uh, bro, bro, not like a, hey bro, but bro is a very hardly ever spoken of network security, intrusion detection, intrusion monitoring, uh, traffic monitoring free package. And we use bro to look at our traffic and pick up some identifiers. And when we see something that looks like a, a amplification, DNS amplification attack, we can collect that data and inject it into ExaBGP and poof, make that go away. Or somebody doing a SIP scan, I can grab those scanner IPs in about 15 seconds after a scanner starts and shove that into ExaBGP and across my peering connections and my core routers, that source IP address is now bye-bye. I won't see traffic from that source IP anymore. Suricata, how many of you guys have heard of Suricata? How many of you heard of Snort? Okay, Suricata is like Snort, but I think a little bit better and a lot more open source. Um, and they're kind of cute too. 
Suricata is, is, is an alternative to snort. I'm using it. I like it. It works pretty doggone good. So congratulations. I mean, first of all, thank, first of all, thank you. Um, that's basically my, my presentation. I'm open to questions. Um, my summary points are going to be true network engineering is not a spectator sport. It is something you have to sit down, close the door, kick the kids out, kick everybody else out for a few minutes, draw it out, walk it through, think about it, make sure you understand what's happening on paper. When you think you do, then turn around and go grab some gear and lab it up and test it. And when you think that's all good and dandy, turn it all off, come back tomorrow, test it again. And then when you're ready to deploy it into your network, go ahead and deploy it, but make sure you have a backup plan, make sure you have a backup of your configurations so that when it doesn't work, and trust me, there will be times when it doesn't work. When it doesn't work, you can go, oh, that's okay. It's too late at night. I'm gonna go ahead and just restore my backup and I'll come back and try to figure out what's broken tomorrow in the lab, okay? There are many things that we need to put in our toolbox. And that's what we're trying to build, is build a sharper, better set of tools we can put in our toolbox to manage our networks. Those of us that are WISPs, we are going to become more and more targets for denial of service and other cyber miscreants on our networks. And we're gonna feel that pain more than the big fiber only folks. And the reason is, is that we have precious commodity of transporting of packets. We are shoving that across the microwave link. There's only so many time slots, only so much we can push down that microwave link. So we want to have a good set of tools. And I would encourage you to go look at previous mums, look at Tom Smith's presentations, look at Lorenzo's presentations, look at other folks' presentations about some of these advanced topics. Then do things in your network to make sure you're not a participant in those bad things that are happening. Make sure your micro ticks at a subscriber or at a tower or at a data center aggregation point aren't going to be part of a DNS amplification attack or an SSTP attack or an NTP attack. Know what's going into your network, know why it's going into your network and know why you care about it and apply the same to what's coming out of your network. I want to say thanks for everybody. I want to say thank you to all the new Microtech uh, trainers that got certified earlier this week. Uh, welcome to the club. I hope all of us will be able to go out and, and educate more. Um, that's a great thing. I want to say thank you to Microtech for an awesome product and an awesome set of people um, in Latvia. Tom Smith, my inspiration for this uh, presentation. Thank you, Tom. Lorenzo, inspiration for Microtech flows and actually going back and putting net flows in with my Microtechs because right now I've only been doing it on my Junipers. Um, so now I'm going to start doing it on my, um, my Microtechs. I can be reached at john.mum at citylinkfiber.com. My mobile number is up there. Um, if you want my PGP key, it's on the PGP MIT uh, key server. That is the correct fingerprint. There are two keys up there. Use the key that has this fingerprint if you need to send me something uh, encrypted. If you're going to send me a config you want me to look at, something like that, please don't send it in the clear. Even if you think you've sanitized it, send it to me PGP'd, and I'll be able to look at it. It just makes it, there's no reason for someone to see your config. So I will now go to the blue screen of death and take questions. Yes, sir. Where's our question person? Okie dokie. He can talk loud and I can repeat questions. I can also just walk up here, too. <clears throat> what, what's your thoughts on uh, BGP flow spec? Are you, are you doing anything with it in FastNetMon? Or? What's my thoughts on BGP flow spec and uh, FastNetMon? I am not doing anything in production yet. Um, I'm playing with it in a lab, and maybe uh, summer or fall I'll have a more intelligent public response. Okay. Next Other question. questions? There. Okay. Come on, guys, ask questions. Sorry. 
John, two things. The first one, when you have uh, like denial of service attacks coming in, distributed denial of service, obviously you're watching the net flows, but how are you getting the information from net flow to a list somewhere to be injected? Is that manual or do you have an automated script that can pull that out? Um, you can automate that. You can set triggers uh, depending on what your flow collecting tools are. You can set triggers that will um, pop up when you know so many packets per second or whatever your, your fingerprinting or indication of compromise or indication of attack uh, values are and then you can take those you can take those prefixes and automatically inject them. Okay. And the second one is when you automate like the black holing, do you use a timeout and you after 15 minutes remove the black hole and watch again for it or how do you do that? Um, that's a really good question. So um, I'm going to take that with two parts of the answer because there's black holing based on destination, there's black holing based on source. So when I tell my upstream transit providers to go ahead and drop a prefix, drop traffic to a particular prefix, um, I typically will do that for an hour and then I'll come back and look. Uh, if we still see traffic or indications uh, of that, then we'll go ahead and continue it. Another thing I might do is I might announce some more specific towards another transit provider and see if I see traffic leaking in from them that would tell me I need to continue doing it. But usually that gets down into a lot of, uh, of manual. Um, on the dropping based on source, uh, right now it's manual, but we're in the process of rewriting the code to go ahead and put it into a SQL database. So ExitBGP will pull from the SQL database, and in the SQL database I will have time to live values for those prefixes, and based on those time to lives is how long I'll keep them in. The other thing I'm doing is I'm also making sure that I don't end up being sort of a secondary DDoS. In other words, have somebody go out and spoof www.google's IPs and send me traffic based on those source spoofed. So I'm building into the uh, SQL database, I'm building in the ability to do uh, whitelisting of important IPs. So we don't inadvertently drop them. Thank you. Um, and on a note of the code, I, I will be setting up a GitHub and making that stuff available to the community. Thank Other questions? You. Thank you. Other questions? Come on, there's got to be more questions than that. Michelob, Coors, Heineken, VB, yes. Fosters. Okay, thank you. All right. John. Thank you.